explore and know you more intimately as our Lord and our Savior. And all God's people said, amen and amen. So we've been looking at the sovereign power of God through the story of Esther, how God has used primarily Esther and Mordecai to literally be the difference makers in the life of not just their life, but the life of God's people, God's Jewish people, the Israelites that are in captivity still in this time. And so they've moved in such a way because God has moved things around. I want us to understand again how God's planning and his timing benefits his people. Amen? God's planning and God's timing always benefits the church if we'll allow it to be a benefit to us. Sometimes we don't like how he moves the pieces. Sometimes we, we're not even really happy with his timing. Come on, Lord, quicker, quicker. But if we'll just submit to that, I assure you he's going to be faithful and just. God works through the most unlikely people. Everybody say God works through the unlikely people. You know, we have this perception still in humanity that you have to be this specific person with this specific skill sets for God to really use you. Let me tell you, God is still in the business of using people behind the scenes that you never know what they're doing. But some of the things that they're doing literally is the difference in the strength and the health of a church. Amen? You may not know it. You may not always know all the details. But it's not always the one that's up there with the loudest mouth, the loudest voice that makes the biggest impact, though it oftentimes can be. It's the whole group of people, the unseen people, those who do the wonderful works of God when no one else is expecting it or accomplishing it. So if you'll do that and accomplish this, well, I promise you, great days lie in your life and in the church. So let's look at Esther chapter 5. We've worked our way through the first four chapters, and tonight we're going to work our way through the rest of the book. I know that may sound like a lot, but really the book of Esther is not a very long book. It's a, it's a rather small, but it's a very profound book. The, the message tonight, the, the, I've entitled it, God's Protection and Elevation. How many people long for God's protection? I long for it every day. I don't know how we would survive without his protection, especially in the current culture and environment that we live in. But I want you to understand that not only does God protect us, but while he's protecting us, he's preparing to elevate us. And a lot of people will often feel like, well, God, what, how can I be used? God, what can I do? It's all about being prepared where you are for when he needs you to step up to the next level. God will always raise up those who are submitted to him and his plan. It's those who are in their own wisdom, their own ways, that never really get anywhere. They may seem like they get somewhere in the world's eyes, but when it comes down to what God wants, he elevates those who are humble and who are willing to do his will. So we're going to look at how that plays out in the story through the rest of this book tonight. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 5 in Esther, it says, Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner courts of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight, and the king had out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand, that Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. So three days after what? Three days after she had given word back to Mordecai, yes, even if it cost me my life, because I don't know if the king's going to pardon me to, to be received or if the law will be uh, put up on my head and I will lose my life. So three days after she committed to go to the king to speak on the behalf of her people, on the behalf of God's people, she walks in and the king receives her. By giving out the scepter, he is saying that I am given my authority. I am giving my permission. I am giving you a pardon to come to me. 
And the king said in verse 3, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Now, this is every woman's dream. A man will give her half a kingdom. He doesn't know what she wants. All he knows is whatever she wants, he's going to give her up to half the kingdom. That could be tempting for some people. You know, you're going in there with one motive and one, one idea, and then all of a sudden you get hit with this unbelievable opportunity. So Esther answers, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Now see where they're at right now. Is they, have, they have basically what we would call two courses or two meals that typically was within the Persian way of eating meals in royalty. They had what we would call the regular meal, which is where you, you get all your food, all your substance, the breads, the meats, the vegetables, potatoes, depending on what, what kind of person you are. But then they would have this second time period at which they would drink wine. It was a time after the meal, but it was still a time where they're fellowshipping and consuming. It's just what they're consuming has now changed. As you can imagine, a lot of times bad decisions are made during this time of the meal. Because unfortunately, some people take a little bit more liberty with their wine than they should. Then the king said, bring, uh, sorry. Then Esther answered him and said, in verse 7, My petition and my request is this. I have found favor in the sight of the king, and it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request. Then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them and tomorrow, I will do as the king has said. So this has got to be perplexing to the king. He had, Remember, he said, quickly, go bring Haman so we can have this banquet that the queen is wanting to prepare for us. Quickly get him here. So he gets him there with the expectation that the queen is going to reveal why she has called them together. But sometimes his wife's do. She throws a wrench in it. And she says, oh, no, let's come back. Tomorrow, You know, this is really kind of a, a, an ironic picture if you think about it. If you think about it, as I've shared before in this series, uh, in many ways, uh, Esther is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Esther is there as a foreshadow as Christ came to save his people, not simply the Jews but all people. Esther is there to be a Savior, a Messiah for the people at this time. And likewise, just as it says in Psalms 23, uh, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemy. As you know, Haman is the enemy. Haman is an evil, vile enemy. As a matter of fact, he's sort of like a prototype, if you will, of Satan in this story. And so here it is. Jesus has prepared this table in the presence of the enemy but going, you know, or I should say Esther has prepared this in the presence of the enemy. So there's a foreshadowing there. She wants to first and foremost honor the king. She wants to gain his confidence. Why not simply just say what she has to say at this first meal? Remember, her life and the lives of those that she loves, her people, are on the line. Why come back a second time? She's gaining the confidence of her king. Clearly, she has favor with him. He allowed her to come when it was not always permissible to come. But she's also preparing to expose the wickedness of Haman. Likewise, we need to be always prepared to do the same thing. When we go out into the world, we need to be prepared to expose the works of the enemy. And the works of the enemy are plenty right now. You don't have to go far to find them, but we need to expose them. Not because we want to ruin people that are being used by the enemy. The reality is, is not all people are good. As a matter of fact, the Bible says not one of us are good. But there are those who choose God over self. They choose righteousness and holiness over self. And those are the ones that are aiming, they're longing, they're looking for the return of Christ. And there's others who reject that. 
You can be a good person and still reject Jesus. And so we need to expose the things that are going on in our world. So my opinion, I can't prove this in Scripture, there's a lot of theology about why does she, she delay. Some people would say, oh, well, we think she delayed because she wasn't prepared. She was nervous. And so for that reason, she didn't do it that night. I personally believe when I read this book of this woman, in all the events in her life, and all the steps that she'd taken, she was constantly listening to God. A lot of times that was listening through her cousin Mordecai, but she was listening for the next instruction of God. And I believe God said, not yet. Not yet. Hold off one more day. Why? I don't know. But God knows. And so that's exactly what I believe is occurring. Let's get back into verse 9. It says, so Haman went out that day joyful with a glad heart. He is exceedingly on cloud nine. You cannot burst this man's bubble, or can you? But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand and tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. You see, even after... Haman had received this great honor. He had a personal invite to a meal with the king and the queen. He had been elevated to being second in the land. He enjoys a position and even favor and even intimate time with the king and queen that nobody else in the land gets to enjoy. But it wasn't good enough. For the man of pride. He couldn't accept the fact that there was one thorn still in his side. And so he leaves this grand opportunity to just relish in the events. And he quickly turns to disdain. Not even the honor of the king lifts him up. This is literally the game plan for believers in Christ. You want to ruin the devil's day? Look at him the next time he comes parading in your life. The next time he decides he wants to, to make you follow his ways or to influence you in a certain way. And just smile at him and say, you're not good enough. You don't have it. My king is all I need. Even if he takes everything away from me, he's still good enough. And you won't take my joy. Because then he'll be just like Haman. He's going to pout. He's going to throw a hissy fit. He's going to be upset. Why? Because he knows he can't get to you. Verse 10 says, Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called for his children and his wife, Zeresh. Now, I believe if we were to correctly translate this passage, I really took time to study this particular Verse, I don't believe it was Haman who restrained himself. Amen? I believe it was God Almighty restraining Haman, holding him back, much like he did with Pharaoh. You realize Pharaoh, if Pharaoh really had the authority and the power that he had, he could have simply cut down Moses and Aaron and been done with it. Take off those two and the rest of them will fall like bricks. But he didn't have the power to go beyond the measure that God was permitting. Just like when we read the story of Job, the enemy, Satan, could only do what was permissible by God Almighty. And even though Haman, a prideful man, an arrogant man who thought he had all the power, God was still in control. Verse 11 says, And Haman turned them, uh, told them, which is his family, of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above all the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, Beside Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow I'm again invited to her to be with her along with the king. Let all this avail me nothing so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the king's gate. 
Then his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made. Now listen to this. Fifty cubits high. And in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it, when, uh, then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And this thing pleased Taman, and he had the gallows made. Again, he is now before his family testifying of all the great things that the king has done for him, that the queen has done for him. But he still says, even though all of this is happening, I have reached the top. Short of being the king of Persia, I am at the top and I have everything except for that Jew that's holding me back and those people that are holding me back. This is what the enemy still does to the church, folks. When the, when the church is doing God's bidding and God's will, the enemy will attack. The enemy never attacks a church that's back on its heels doing nothing. He's always attacking a church, a people, a, a, a believer who is at God's will and doing the work of God. And, of course, his family says, hey, just build a gallow, which I've explained before, a gallow is not like what you and I are thinking. It's not a platform with a noose in which someone will be dropped and be hanged. That's not what a gallow is. They, when they refer to a gallow, they are talking about literally a spike in which someone is impaled on. Uh, if you know your history, if you know Vlad, uh, which we now call Vlad Dracula, uh, he would impale everyone that was his enemy. They uh, were quintessential at this act this is a 75 foot tall spike well beyond the roof line here imagine a spike that is nearly eight stories tall we don't have any buildings here in town that are eight stories tall so it's a little bit harder to envision but eight stories tall i don't know where you get lumber like that, I know it's not going to be one tree because I've never, I don't know of any tree in that part of the world that grows like that. You know, we have some some sequoias out in the, in redwoods and stuff that might, but not there. So I'm sure they had to put this. But imagine that they want him to be seen above every place in all the land, the body of Mordecai hanging up on this pike, suffering. As he dies, this is the plan of the enemy. But remember what the enemy sows, he, weep, he reaps. What the enemy sows, he'll reap. Remember, the enemy tried to take over heaven. What happened? He got left with this. This is his kingdom right now in all of its failing glory. He doesn't have heaven as his kingdom. He has to have a substitute. Let's keep reading. Esther 6, verse 1. That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were to read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servant said, uh, who attended to him, nothing has been done for him. Now, I really want you to really get the full context here. From the time Mordecai revealed this plot, this coup to take over the king's position, to kill the king so that, that someone else could be in power, whether one of those two or someone else that they were pulling for, it had been five years since he read this account. Five years, nothing had been said about what Mordecai did after the day these two men were put on posts, on pikes. And so five years later, by the providential hand of the Almighty God, the king could not sleep. He couldn't sleep. Now, I don't know. I'm reading into the text. Apparently, reading makes him go to sleep. So he says, hey, go get some books. Go get the Chronicles. It'll put me to sleep. 
And so he go, or he has someone go and get these chronicles. They're reading him almost like a bedtime story. Imagine if that wouldn't put you to sleep real fast, unless you're a historian. But think about this. Not only did God keep the king awake, but God ordained the footsteps of an individual in the library of the Chronicles, okay? So just like we have encyclopedias that tell the history of our nation and of other civilizations, there's this chronicle, this collection of writings. And God took the foot of that, that servant and led him to a specific book among these books. And he brings this book back, not knowing anything about how the king will react, depending upon what he reads. And the king's servant opens this book up. And of all places he could have landed, of all the stories he could have read, of all the accounts of their history, the event of Mordecai saving the king's life was the very story he was open to. Don't you love when God's at work behind the scenes? When he's making things work for your favor. You see, think about this. The king doesn't know what Haman is doing behind the scenes. He has no knowledge of it. As a matter of fact, as I shared with you, he didn't even know what was in the edict. He didn't even know what group of people he's going to basically slaughter. He just said, hey, I trust you. Here's my ring. I sign off on it. But God knew. And God ordained everything perfectly. For the protection of his people. Not just for Mordecai, but for the protection of his people. Why? Because he was going to elevate someone for a higher purpose. And so he's reading this story and he comes across what happened with Mordecai. And immediately he says, what did we do for him? Apparently it wasn't written down. There wasn't a record of what they did to honor Mordecai for doing this wonderful thing of saving the king's life. And it said... We didn't do anything. What? This man saves my life. He keeps me from dying five years ago and we've not done anything? This is an injustice. This is wrong. This isn't right. Verse 4 says, So the king said, Who is in the court? Imagine, right as this is happening, someone comes in. The king is trying to find a way to go to sleep, right? He's trying to get rest. This is revealed to him. And who just happens to show up as this is happening? Haman. Who's in the court? Now Haman has just entered the outer court of the king's place to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he prepared for him. Somebody was not prepared when he came to the king. The enemy doesn't know God's plan. Now, he does know the ultimate victory is already assured. He knows that God is going to win in the end, that Jesus is the winner in the end. But he doesn't know. We give the enemy way too much credit. We give the devil. I mean, he's sitting there. I I, I think a lot of times the devil's sitting there. How can I get these guys? How can I get these guys? Man, I just know. I made you drink? What? I made you drink? Okay, I made him drink. I think that's how we live. We give him so much credit, and he knows very little, folks. He knows very little about our lives. But he tells him, he tells him, go ahead, let him come in. So verse 6 says, Haman came in, and the king asked him, What shall be done of the man who the king delights to honor? Of all the people the king could ask this of. Haman stops in his tracks. Remember, he was coming with a purpose, with a plan. He had a destiny to tell the king that Mordecai must hang. And king, you don't have to worry about it. I've already built this this pole that's almost 80 feet tall, and we're going to make a spectacle of him. But if you want to honor somebody, surely there's nobody in the kingdom that the king wants to honor more than me. There's no way that it could be anyone but me. Now, Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? 
And Haman answered the king. So now that he believes it's him that's going to be honored. This is the enemy, folks. The enemy loves to have their ego stroke. The enemy loves to float around with these big heads. So he says, oh, well, if the king's going to honor me, then let's do this thing right. Let's don't just kind of honor me. Let's honor me. For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought. Now listen, which the king has worn. And a horse on which the king has ridden. Which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and this horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes. That he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the whole city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. The enemy loves to be on the spectacle. The enemy, think about this. I want you to understand what's really going on here. In case, you, maybe, you, maybe you caught it, maybe you haven't. But if you haven't, listen to what I'm about to tell you. This man was so prideful, so arrogant, so conceited. It was the only thing greater than his hate for the Jewish people. That he says... Well, if the king wants to honor me, then the king shall honor me as the king. Did y'all catch that? This is what the devil does. The devil tried to take over heaven, and a third of the angels fell because of the devil, because of following him trying to take over the king. And Haman, his mind is saying, oh, if they could just see me paraded as the king, then shortly thereafter, surely since I'm number two, I can be number one. So why don't I practice wearing the royal robe and riding the royal stallion and being paraded among all in the capital? This is what is happening. Then the king says to Haman, not knowing Haman's plans, not knowing his thoughts, I love this. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor, because he does. Hurry, take the robe and the horse, as you have suggested, and do so to Mordecai. I mean, he is completely zapped. The man he had just come in, who was so excited... Remember, it was going to be another long time, nearly nine months roughly, before the rest of the Jews were going to be killed. But now he could finally take out Mordecai. But instead of taking out Mordecai, the king says, go and honor him. Go and do exactly as you said. <coughs> but it doesn't stop there. <laughs> Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. Verse 11. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him. Haman was the servant, not the honored guests. Come on, somebody. That should excite you. He arrayed him and led the horse back through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Not only did Mordecai not bow a knee to Haman, now Haman is parading him around. Everybody in the city close to Haman knew how he felt about this man. Knew his plan, his vengeance, his goals against this man. And he's the one that's walking as the servant proclaiming the honor of Mordecai. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Trust me, when you stay in God's will and you're faithful to Him, your enemies will sometimes be your footstools. I'll say that again. If you stay in God's will and His plan, 
he will sometimes put your enemies as your footstools. And we don't get puffed up about it, but it's really nice to see God put people in their place. Matter of fact, Luke 14, 11 says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Haman, the enemy of God, paraded the prized child of God and was humiliated. Verse 12 says, afterwards Mordecai went back to the king's gates. He had just been in the king's robe. Rode on the king's horse, been paraded around the city, around the square. And he simply gets off in humility, goes back to his position, setting in the gate. He didn't get puffed up. He didn't say, well, bless God, the king noticed me. He went back to where God had assigned him, even after the honor. But Haman hurried to this to his house, mourning, think about this, And with his head covered. Folks, this was more to Haman than simply humiliation. Haman mourned with his head covered. And basically what that means is he was in sorrow just as someone would be in sorrow at a funeral of a loved one. This was more than humiliation. He had been put under. Before all of the people, he thought he was elevated about. (coughs) When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all of his friends everything that had happened to him, they're going to give him counsel. But I want you to remember, (coughs) a few hours before, they were cheering him on. They were egging him on. They were saying, oh, get your vengeance. Just build a a gallow 75 cubits high. Just build it that high. But listen to what they say now. It's interesting. Sometimes the enemy thinks that they have friends. (laughs) But it's amazing how quick the enemy's friends will turn on the enemy when it doesn't suit their needs. His wife... His wise men, they said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Thank you, sweetheart. The very people that were egging him on, get that Mordecai, get that Jew. Bring him down. Make a public spectacle of him. Hang him high above the roof lines where everybody can see. But I think they read the writing on the wall. I love it when when the enemy reads the writing on the wall. I don't know this. It doesn't say in Scripture, so I'm I'm just going to tell you my personal opinion. I believe they begin to remember the work of God in the Israelites when he delivered them from Egypt and the ten plagues. Because remember, this was history that was known then, folks. This was not something that, that had just happened. They, didn't, they knew the story. The Jews had been among this group of people for more than 70 years, roughly. And they, I'm sure, had shared the story of how God had brought them out of Egypt. And I think they start thinking, well, hold on. Now, now hold on, Haman. You know, we, we understand what you're saying, but... Remember those Jews, God's on their side. Yeah, he, he put them in captivity, but he's also brought them out many times. Do you remember what happened to Egypt? Haman, do you remember what happened to the people of Canaan as they would fight against them? What happened to the king of Moab, of Edom? Do you, do you remember what happens when people come up against the Israelites? This is what I believe happened. They're turning against him. They're saying, if it's Mordecai or you, you might want to rethink this thing. And while they were still talking with him, the king's units came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. Chapter 10, or excuse me, chapter 7 says, So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther, and on the second day, meaning this was the second event, 
We talked about the first one in the first banquet that they had. Now this is the second day. At the banquet of the wine, so the second meal of this encounter, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Three times he's offered her half the kingdom. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue. Although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Let's stop there for just a minute. What is she saying? Let's unpack this. She's now talking to the king that we know at this moment in time does not know that Esther is a Jew. He doesn't know this. He's unaware of this. She's saying, I don't want half the kingdom. I just want my life and the life of my people to be spared. And she goes even further. And she quotes what was in the petition itself, that they should be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Word for word, that's what it said. She's given an account of what's about to happen to her and her people. She, she goes even further. She says, look, if we were just simply being sold as slaves, I wouldn't even say a word. I wouldn't say anything. But the event, now catch this, that is being brought against us, what's about to occur to us, will not compensate the king. You remember what instigated this event between Haman and the king? Not only did Haman tell him there is these evil people among them, he bribes the king that he will gain much wealth through the annihilation of this people. And she's saying no amount of wealth can compensate for the loss. No, you cannot get enough money, king, by killing off all the Jews because how will you replace all the Jews and all that they do and the wealth that they contribute to the, your kingdom? I love how God plays this stuff out and makes sure every detail is covered when someone is being exposed. So King Xerxes answered and said to the queen, Who is he? Where is he? Who would dare to presume in his heart to do such a thing? Now, this seems like the king responded as adequate. He's quickly turned around saying, what is going on? What do you mean? Who would dare do this? But if you were to go back to the original text, the proper translation is that he repeatedly says this. Who is it? Who would dare to do this? Tell me. Who is this? Who has the audacity? He's really livid, not just passively upset. And Esther says, <coughs> excuse me. The adversary, the enemy, is this wicked Haman. You see, folks, when you're under attack, you need to call out the enemy. You need to call out the adversary. Let's don't give him undue credit. Sometimes we're in positions struggling with things because we're making those choices. But when the enemy is coming to attack God's people, and he's coming to attack the church, he needs to be exposed for who he is. We don't sugarcoat it. We don't just say, oh, well, you know, we, you call it out. And you say that evil Satan, that evil dragon, that beast that looks to destroy us, that's who's causing these issues. And she does. So Haman was terrified before the king. So I'm going to just summarize for the sake of time. The king leaps momentarily. And goes into his garden. 
I suspect he's furious at this moment, but maybe he's trying to gather his thoughts to think, what should I, how should I handle this? What should I do? I don't simply just want to go off hinge and, and make things worse. What do I need to do? So he goes out. He's taking time, thinking it through. He comes back in, and what should he find? But Herman is laid out over this sofa that the queen is on. Kind of reflective of uh, some of the other events in the Bible when people were mistaken what their actions were. And so he's laid out, he's face down, begging the queen, and the king believes that he is trying to rape the queen right when he's trying to make decision about it. So he is absolutely livid. So he says, basically, what do we need to do? How should we do this? And I don't know, I, I, <clears throat> I could be wrong, but I, I suspect that this servant of the king was actually a little excited that the enemy was about to get what was coming to him. Well, what makes you think that, Chris? Well, because this is his response to the king. Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who spoke good of the king on, by, on his behalf, is standing at the house of Amon. The king said, hang him on it. Hang him on it. He built it. Perfect. Destroy him on what he's built for the destruction of God's people. Come on, somebody, that sure excites you. Let's skip to chapter 8. On that day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the house of Haman. So not only did Haman fall, but the queen inherited all that he had received. Remember, he was the number two person in all the kingdom. His wealth was unequal. He was higher than any other prince. He had it all going for him. But everything that he had acquired and inherited had now been given to those whom he sought to destroy. God makes sure what the enemy stole was given back to his people in multiplication. Not only does this happen, but he also says, And, the, uh, and Mordecai came before the king. For Esther had told who had related it to her. So this is the second time Mordecai has brought up a plot that wasn't meant for the, the king's benefit. The second time Mordecai has revealed this. And so now he is in the place, in the role, in the position of the evil Haman. Now a righteous man, a godly man is put in this role. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and he gives it to Mordecai. And Esther appoints Mordecai over the house of Haman. Folks, this is what Jesus has done. Jesus took on the cross. While in the grave, he went down and took back the keys to the grave. He took back victory over the enemy. He said, you don't have a winning chance if they will come and receive my free gift. You will lose, you will fall, and everything you think you have will be turned back over to you. So they found favor in the king's eyes, and all these things were done. But they also had to have a plan on how do we deal with the scheme that Mordecai did. And so the king asked her, and she says in verse 5, If it pleases the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the things seem right in the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letter devised by Haman, the son of Hamenadoth the Agagite which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that which comes to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Xerxes says to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourself... 
write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So the king's scribes were called at that time. Now listen, in the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day. Now if you remember, I've shared with you that the events were initiated in the month of Nisan or the month of Abib which is the first month of the year. And so only roughly two months after the scheme and ploy was initially started that would take place nearly 12 months later, the plot has been exposed two months in. The evil leader has fallen. And now not only... Has the decree to destroy the people been overturned? But the king allows them to make this decree. And this is what I love. Not only did God take out Haman, but he gave his people, the Jewish people, nine to ten months to prepare for the event that was still to come. Remember, once the king made a decree, it couldn't be canceled. The decree to kill the Jews was still in place. It wouldn't occur for about 10 more months. But this second decree is written, giving them plenty of time to prepare. And in this second decree, they are told that they can stand their ground. Okay, it's a stand your ground law. We like those in states whenever we have to deal with things like this. It's a stand your ground law. And it basically says, anyone who comes against you, do whatever you want to them. Anyone that comes against you, stand up against them. So in chapter 10, I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'm just, again, for the sake of time, going to summarize this. But in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, we're told that when they get to the event on the tw uh, 12th month, the month of Adar, the 13th day, the day that this event is to take place, They've already been notified what's going to happen. It says that the Jews themselves overpower those who hated them. This is what the church does, people. God's given us victory. Amen? He's assured us victory. It doesn't always look the way, but he says, I've made you overcomers. So they were assured victory. It goes on in verse four to, or in verse 5 of chapter 9 to say, the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with the slaughter and destruction. They did what pleased with those who hated them. Skipping down to verse 12, it says, Then the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Susa, the citadel. And the ten says of Haman, What have they done to the rest of the king's province? Now, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. So Esther says, Well, hold on. Give us tomorrow also. Give us another day to clean house. And so it says that uh, not only did they ask to clean house, but they asked for the ten evil sons of Haman to be destroyed. They had the same fate as their father. Evil begets evil. And you have to wash out all evil. You don't coat it over. You don't just say, well, we'll let it. it. Wherever there's evil, it needs to be put into the light. It needs to be exposed and it needs to be dealt with. And so it says that they were hung and another 300 men were killed. The number and through the whole providence of the king that was killed that came against the Hebrews, against the Jews, was 75,000 of their enemies. Complete annihilation of the enemies of God. And they did not lay hand on the plunder. See, they could have taken it in, but they weren't. that wasn't their motive. Their motive was to remain the house of God, to be God's people. <clears throat> and so if you were to continue to read in, in chapter 9, it goes further in the king in verse 7. Uh, on the 13th day of the month of Adar, on the 14th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So it becomes a celebration. Yearly, 
on the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar, they have a celebration because the king created an edict for it to occur. It's called Purim. Now, for those of you who don't know, Purim is one of the major Jewish holidays throughout the year. It's not one of the holy holidays. It's not unleavened bread. It's not Feast of Tabernacles. It's not Passover. It's not any of those. But it is a, a event, a day that they celebrate every single year because of what God did to protect his people from evil in the Persian Empire, Haman, through Esther and Mordecai. It still happens today. As a matter of fact, it's on the 14th day of Adar every year, which is according to the Jewish calendar, but in the Gregorian calendar it can fall in the month of March or in the month of February, depending on how those two calendars line up. But let me finish with this last chapter. It's only three verses. Chapter 10 is a summary of why this message is is given with the name that it's given of protection and elevation. Protection and elevation. You see, God protected every one of the Jews. Not one of them. The account would have been clear if it had happened. Not one of them lost their lives. All of the enemy lost this. There was protection. There was protection repeatedly over this span of time. Nearly eight years where Esther was, was given, uh, you know, providential treatment, elevated. She was protected. She was elevated. Mordecai was protected all these years, and he was elevated. Esther 10, verse 1. And King Xerxes imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now all the acts of this power and his might, the account of the greatness of Mordecai. The man that sat in the king's gate. To which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Xerxes and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. Stand to your feet as we close tonight. I hope as we've gone through the study of Ruth and the study of the book of Esther that God has done for you as he's done for me and he's in, He's given you deeper insight, deeper understanding, shown you the connections of these stories to the soon coming king, shown you how God even in our lives today, works things out for the good of his children. It doesn't always make sense. Sometimes you still may say, why? Why this way? Of all the ways you could do it. But understand, if you're his, you're protected. You see, because even the word says, even if this world can steal the body, the one that we have to, to be most adhered to, the one closest to, is the one that can take away the soul. And his highest gift is to our soul. Remember, we're creating his image. Not this is not his image. Our spirit, our soul. He protects that for eternity. Matter of fact, this body will be renewed and a lot better than the model we got right now. But he protects our spirit, our soul, the eternal And not only does he look to elevate us here, but folks, his protection to those who are his children will elevate us to his kingdom, which is the ultimate goal. Can we praise him tonight for his protection in our life and for the elevation that he has done in our lives here, but even more importantly, that that he's going to do when the trumpet sounds. Lord, I just praise you so much for these, these writings that you put in your holy book, in the lives uh, of Ruth and of Esther to show us how you are at work in the lives of those who choose you, those who give up everything and said, I will follow you. I'll repent and turn from this nature of who I am, uh, the falling state that I'm in, and I'll receive Jesus as Lord 
and Savior, if for no other reason but for eternity in your presence. Lord, I pray for your protection over your children. The enemy does not bother with those that are not your children. They can be good people, but he, he doesn't have to worry about good people. What he has to worry about is those who have committed to your kingdom. And Lord, so I pray for a hedge of protection around those who have committed to your kingdom through repentance and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would keep the enemy more than just an arm distance away. But Lord, that there would be furlongs that the enemy can't come. The enemy won't have the ability. And should the enemy, for whatever reason, under your divine testing come near, I pray for the entire armor of God to be upon this people. That if the enemy comes near, that every protection will be in place. The shield will be in place. The breastplate, the, the feet uh, will be covered and shod. Lord, that we would have the, the one tool in our armor that's the offensive, which is the mighty word of God itself. And Lord, I pray for your favor and elevation of your children. May they be put in places of influence. Maybe titles don't come. Maybe it's not even so much position, but you'll put them in a place where nobody else is going. Perhaps it's their neighborhood. Perhaps it's those around them. Perhaps it's their co-workers. But Lord, you're putting them where no one else will go. You're elevating them so that your word can penetrate the hearts of men and women and children. Yeah, I pray, God, your protection that will help them have those open doors and opportunities that will elevate you in the eyes of these people. But, Lord, I also pray a continual race that one day will elevate us all into your glorious presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.